Hello and welcome to The Third Rail. I'm Sarah. Tonight we have a feature episode on feminism. Yes, International Women's Day has come and gone, but we think this issue is important enough to talk about more than once a year. So here I am <laughs> with Erin Goff and Rachel Jacobs. Erin is the author of a book for young adults called The Flywheel and the soon-to-be-released Amelia Westlake. She is also a lawyer. Rachel is a community activist, a columnist for the Huffington Post and a lecturer at Western Sydney University. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So I wanted to start broadly with a heavy topic, which is that of feminism, intersectional identity and identity politics. <laughs> what I wanted to ask, and Rachel, I thought I'd ask you first, mm. is whether as a society we are now too focused on the issue of identity politics to the detriment of what some people might discuss or describe as the real bread and butter issues like climate change, housing affordability, cost of living. What do you think? Well, firstly, those issues do affect women adversely, particularly poor women. So those are actually feminist issues in themselves. But, you know, one of the things when people say, oh, we're too caught up in identity politics, is they assume that that's not a real issue, that that doesn't have bearing on someone's lives. And as we know, um, for young women in particular, you can't be what you can't see. So the representation of women, that's that's vitally important. How women identify as feminists and as women, that's, that's hugely important. Women of colour, like myself, needing to be heard, you know, that's, that's vitally important as well. We can't have a say on addressing poverty, climate change, inequality. Mm. Um, if we don't have represent, representation and if we don't aren't able to speak for ourselves and say, based on my experience, this is exactly what I think. And the other thing is people who ask us not to talk about identity politics, they're usually the ones who like to pigeonhole us most. So it's usually white people ask me where I'm from and, you know, putting mm. me in that box that says not a real Australian woman. Mm. Um, so... I think you get pigeonholed whether you want to or not. So it's about time we were able to speak for ourselves. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's sort of the, what you've said actually raises a, a sort of subtopic, I guess. And Erin, I was going to ask you about this, which is the issue about whether or not, um, wh whether you think it's enough for, for us to be talking about diversity, increased diversity on our screens, in the arts, in politics, in business, or, or do we need something more in order to achieve true equality between the genders and, and broadly, um, I suppose, between different identity groups? Look, I, I mean, I certainly think when, when you're talking about representation in arts and in our culture, um, it's, certainly, it's certainly not enough. Um, when you're talking about representation and diversity in those other areas, in, you know, in business and, and I guess in industries, I mean, they're really the structures that we do need diversity in. When it comes to representation, I think, in culture, um, it certainly, um, I think it very much depends on the way you do it in terms of the value of it, because tokenism can be an issue. Um, but I also think that while it's not enough to have people represented uh, you know, in culture and say, for example, on our television screens, it's not nothing. Mm. Uh, we heard what uh, Gina Davis had to say when she was in Sydney a few years ago. Oh, sorry, not a few years ago. She was here a couple of weeks ago. Um, and what she um, has done, she's actually established a, a, a research uh, institute. I love Gina Davis. Isn't she great? She's great. Um, and uh, it's called See Jane. And the idea is if you see, if a woman sees um, somebody on the screen being able to do something, then she'll feel like she can do it herself. Mm -hmm. And some interesting research has come out of the work that Gina Davis has done. Uh, she's found that the more television girls watch, the less self-esteem they have, oh, wow. uh, as opposed to boys, where the more television they watch, the higher their self-esteem and also the more sexist they are. Because if you look at the representation of women on screens, uh, you, there's not as many women on screen. Uh, women aren't as well represented in, for example, professions like being doctors and lawyers on television. Um, and a really interesting anecdote that, that uh, they had a research paper on was about the spike in participants in national archery competitions in the States, f f um, female young girls in archery competitions after the Hunger Games came out. All right. So you kind of, you know, you've got that um, direct response um, to feeling inspired um, to see yourself on the screen being able to do something and therefore feeling like you can embrace that in your own life. Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly for me anyway, that you, and it's something that I read and I can't remember who said it, but I think sometimes when it's easy for, say, predominantly white men to cry about identity politics mm -hmm. and say, oh, what a waste of time, all we ever do is mm -hmm. whinge about it. 
And it's all very well and good when you look like the way um, power structures expect you to look. But when you mm. don't look in that way, that way, it's a real issue. And I, mm. I certainly find personally for me, I, I walk into a room not seeing my colour or my mm. gender. I'm just mm. who I am. But mm. other people see me in that way. So mm. I don't know, Rachel, if you have a similar Oh, response. oh, mm. constantly. You know what I referred to before. You know where are you where are you from and and things like that. And mm. you're or you're exoticized. You know mm. um, for the way you look. And um, just as a side note, we're recording this on Harmony Day. Mm. Um, now Harmony Day, I'm I'm a teacher, so um, have partaken in Harmony Day pretty much everywhere I've taught, and it's just tokenized to the extreme. Oh. You know, it's about food and. Um, culture, but going back to the stories, you know, Erin, you're you're a writer and do some great mm. representation of women. So I don't think it's just TV though um, mm. that's the culprit. So there's this yeah. great video where mm. um, children's books were put on the microscope, mm. and all the children's books that didn't feature women, or where women didn't talk, were removed from the shelves of a library, and it was depressing what was left on the shelf um, and once again you know what we're asking um, young women to aspire to we actually have to show them mm. we actually have yeah. to show them that that's possible mm. that's right and um, I found <clears throat> as my in my experience as a young adult uh, writer um, it's something that that young adults really appreciate uh, seeing themselves represented. Mm. My book, The Flywheel, has a gay protagonist and um, the key reason I wrote it was because I wanted to write the book that was not available when I was young. There are certainly more books um, with gay protagonists out there than there were, but certainly not representative of, no. you know, the population that we have. Mm. Um, and it, it's something really valuable, I think, to see yourself... Um, and a potential identity being legitimised in that way. Mm -hmm. Someone's actually said, look, this story is worth telling and it's worth publishing and worth, you know, um, distributing. Mm. So um, that can be extremely validating. And I think particularly, you, you know, you talked about children's books. I think that at that time of people's lives, they're really developing their ideas of, of what the norms are mm. and what are. their expectations mm. are. Um, and it's really important that um, we don't cut off their opportunities um, kind of unconsciously. Yeah, no, I agree. Mm. So another um, issue on the intersectionality point mm. is the question of whether or not women should support women, say, for example, in politics, just mm. because they are women. And, of course, we saw this mm. play out in the um, presidential election in the US. And the one thing that actually has just come to my mind about that is when Susan Sarandon got up and said she wouldn't vote uh, for Hillary Clinton... Um, because she didn't vote with her vagina. So I guess mm. um, that really does put it very yeah. expressly. I mean, Erin, what do, what do Look, you think about this? I, I, I didn't vote for Pauline Hanson. Um, yeah. Even though she's a woman. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely right. Look, and I, and I think that, I mean, you can't take that to the extreme, can you? Because um, there aren't going to be necessarily, um, just because they're a woman, they're not necessarily going to represent your interests. Um, and I think that a lot of criticism, for example, that... Um, you know, we've seen flung at certain segments of women, for example, in US society for not voting for Hillary Clinton is, I think we've got to be really careful about that. Mm. Because I also think that, you know, um, we can't assume that certain issues that are important for some women, even if they're women's issues, are going to be as important for other women. Mm. Um, if you are a working class, from a working class um, rural town in somewhere in America, um, you don't have an education, um, you're struggling to put food on the table, there may well be certain issues that you think are better represented from another candidate, even if theoretically that candidate is lying to you about what they can do to you. Mm. Um, but not recognising those core issues for women um, is, is irresponsible. Mm. Yeah. What do you think, Rachel? I, I agree completely with Erin because it's not about just identifying as a woman. Mm. It's about identifying as a woman for women to further that agenda. So Hanson and Jackie Lambie are against women. They make statements mm. about women who dress a certain way, mm. who, you know, subscribe to a certain, um, you know, train of, um, you know, thought. 
Um, they're not out advocating for women. In fact, I'd argue that a lot of those conservative women have gotten where they are out of being the anti-feminists, that uh, men stand up and go, oh, they don't whinge about being a woman. I kind of like that. I'll, mm. I'll put her in a position of power. So they're so, women who are on anti-women platforms. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and wearing their anti-feminism as a badge of honour. So, so no, it is more about women who are um, out to support women for me. Mm. Well, it's interesting. I, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here a little bit and um, <laughs> raise this issue, which is we talked earlier about diversity and the importance of diversity in the arts mm. and in business and in politics because I think where we ended up was basically women want to be able to see people in their image yeah. in positions of yeah. leadership yeah. and on the screens, etc. So, So I guess, I mean... I, I mean, it's a difficult question and certainly, like, I wouldn't vote for Pauline Hanson or Jackie Lambie, um, but I suppose in the American context at least, I, I couldn't quite understand how, how people, how women could vote for Trump after all of the things that he said which were so mm. anti-women. Mm. And, and I think that that's what I struggled with, which probably picks up your point mm. about, you know, you want to be able to support women who support women mm. rather than um, people who don't. But I guess, I guess there's a question, isn't there, about whether or not... I mean, we're so focused on diversity and yet at the same time we're sort of saying, well, we might not necessarily support women just because they're women. It's yeah. the whole package. I mean, what do you think? Well, I think, I mean, coming back to your point about, you know, we like to see ourselves, you know, identify um, with people in politics, for example, I think an interesting case um, in point is Hillary Clinton. And one of the reasons why I think she she lost was because a lot of women didn't identify with her mm. for, for whatever reason. She didn't actually represent um, all of all the women in America. And I think it's really important for us to remember that, that, that just because we're women, we're also a lot of other things. Mm. Um, we bring a lot of other identity politics or, or a lot of other identities um, to our personal experience. It's like, I don't just consider myself a gay person. I don't just consider myself a woman. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of stuff as an individual that, you know, comes into play when somebody's casting a vote. Mm. Well, I mean, it sort of um, leads me to move into our second topic, which is um, always, I think, a vexed one when one talks about feminism, especially around International Women's Day, um, which was, as I said, a couple of weeks ago now, and that is the role of men in feminism. And I wanted to talk about this in the context of a couple of controversies, um, the first being the controversy surrounding the video made by the Sydney Boys High Prefect body for International Women's Day, which went viral. And we'll show you a little clip of that now. Feminism is important to me because when I was 12, my dad told me I should be ashamed of my body and that I had thunder thighs. Feminism is important to me because I was called a bitch and a stupid whore by multiple boys when I refused to send naked pictures of myself to their friend. Feminism is important to me because when I give directions at work, I'm called a bitch rather than a leader and bossy rather than assertive. So, Erin, <laughs> I've got to say, I didn't, I read the Sydney Girls um, piece before I saw this video, which you showed me just before this show, and I actually didn't realise exactly what they've done, but they are speaking as if they're a woman. I know. It's yeah, just no, yeah. outrageous. <laughs> it, is, isn't it? it is outrageous. Yeah. I felt quite outraged as you, well. You do kind of wonder how it got through to the keeper. I just don't understand. And who they... thought this was a good idea? Just, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm going to be gentle on the boys because, mm. um, because they're not adults. Um, and, you know, and they thought they were having a really good go oh, at, clearly. Yeah. at supporting feminism. Mm. But mm. It, is, it is absolutely astounding. Mm. Um, but also at the praise they received. So I saw that mm. video firstly get shared quite widely mm. and get shared mm. by a lot of my friends who consider themselves feminists, feminists and, mm. um, and said, isn't this a great video for IWD? Um, and it was only later when the... Um, backlash happened and the letter from um, the girls high school that they sort of retreated and went well I haven't actually thought about the the misrepresentation or us mm. having to hear these issues through a male voice for them to have relevance. Mm. It is bizarre isn't it and I, it's been interesting on social media looking at the reactions mm. and of course there's been the typical tirade about oh you know men can't do anything right look at the boys they were just trying to help but it, it really, to me, when I looked at the video, I just was gobsmacked for the same reasons as mm. you've identified. And I think the last paragraph of the letter that the mm. Sydney Girls High students wrote, which I think I've got a little um, 
quote of it here, which was something like um, where they say, we need to ask why male voices are needed to bring attention to these issues that if expressed by women would be disregarded. Mm. I actually think that is mm. that's incredibly important. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the key. I think, I, I, I don't think, I mean, sure there are people who dispute this, but um, my view is that it's really important that men are involved in feminism. Um, I went to the IWD march uh, on the weekend in Sydney and it was fantastic to see a lot of men marching alongside women. Um, but I think that what what is uh, disappointing is the different reactions that you see um, when a man makes a feminist um, argument and a man and a woman makes that same argument. Mm. It's a little bit like parenting in public as a mother and a mm. father. People's expectations are different mm. and fathers traditionally uh, get a lot more praise publicly for that kind of thing. I read a really interesting book recently. It's a memoir by a young Melbourneian who um, talks about their transitioning. And one of the interesting anecdotes in that book, it's called Finding Nevo, it's fantastic, I recommend it to, to you, um, is um, t um, Nevo tells a story about um, prior to their transition, they were, um, you know, they'd often make feminist arguments in public spaces and, and cop abuse for it. Post-transitioning and publicly identifying as a male, making those same arguments received applause. Gosh, and I, I mean, that. that just shows you the discrepancy. And they were absolutely outraged it's by so, that um, It's so yeah, true. Yeah. Because yeah. in some circles, being called a, fe a feminist yeah. could be the worst thing that you mm. could call someone. It's thrown, yeah. it's thrown around as an insult. It Whereas a man, when a man stands yeah. up and says, I'm a feminist, um, yeah. it, you know, it, it's, it's praise all, mm. all over. Mm. It, it's applause. And, and they're held to a different standard even mm. on feminism, mm. you yeah. know, it's, it's case in point mm. really for us. Well, no, it is bizarre. Yeah. It's sort of like actually the parenting point is an interesting one because mm. I also <laughs> certainly find that where, where there's a father who takes mm. time out from his day to go to a school activity mm. for his child, praise. Yeah. <laughs> what a committed dad. Oh, what, what a, a great dad. dad. And shot, if mum know? does... <laughs> She yeah. just doesn't have any commitment to her career. And you yeah. feel like going, yes. and Sarah, Seriously? I've heard, I've heard mm. the phrase, oh, Dad's babysitting tonight. Oh, babysitting? Yeah. That's his job. No, it's <laughs> not unbelievable. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you just, babysit? No, I know. The double standards are really quite remarkable. One yeah. of the things that I thought was also interesting about this video, and it's, and it's at the end of it, um, where I think effectively the boys say something like, well, uh, feminism is important to, to the women in our lives and, and so it should be important to us too. Mm. And I thought, well, well no. Like feminism mm. should be important to mm. you because you believe in equality between mm, the absolutely. genders, not because yeah. you've got women in your lives. Mm. And it raised to me the question, it brings in the idea, idea of identity politics more broadly too. Mm. I mean, is the, the concept of um, equality between different cultures or people of ethnic diversity only important to you because you know hmm. yeah. an well, Aboriginal person or you yeah. know someone who's from China? Or, I mean, it's just a bizarre kind of argument. And it's also, it also doesn't... Um, acknowledge that feminism can be really beneficial to men as mm. well. I mean, and we are, you know, if we are talking about parenting, that's one of the prime examples. It's mm. really difficult for men, um, it can be, um, for men to, um, you know, do as much um, primary childcare as women do because it's not as accepted culturally. And that, I mean, that's just one example of how feminism can actually benefit mm -hmm. men as well, but it's not seen so true. that way. So true. Yeah. Look, Sarah, it's, it's, it's a total side issue on, on this one, mm -hmm. but I also want to raise, again, I'm going to put my teaching hat on, mm -hmm. um, Sydney boys and Sydney girls, two very different experiences mm -hmm. on the same topic of feminism. Why are they two different schools? It's 2017. Mm. New South Wales does segregated public, public education mm. like nowhere else in mm. Australia. You don't find as many single-sex public schools mm. in Queensland, you know, in Victoria and things like mm. that, although there, are, although there are a couple. So I've taught in, um, you know, single-sex and co-ed schools and one of the interesting things, I see it played out, is that the boys would have sat there and, and said, we think this is a really, really great idea. Mm. And without a woman in the room, you know, one of their peers going, WTF, mm. put that the <laughs> hell away. You know? yeah, that's right, because there's why no don't, to balance it. Or yeah. why don't we make the video together or something exactly. like that, that educating one sex in the absence of the other, this mm. is just leading them to, you know, um, to be segregated and the boys wanting a medal for saying they're a feminist. Yeah, mm. I, think that, I, mm. I think that that's sort of the feel of it when you watch it. I mean, another of the interesting controversies around International Women's Day 
um, was about um, the much-loved Justin Trudeau, and specifically um, <laughs> his wife, uh, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau. I hope I pronounced it correctly. So she, of course, is married to the self-proclaimed feminist um, Canadian Prime Minister Justin mm-hmm. Trudeau, who everyone uh, loves. And she posted a photo of herself holding hands up with her man, captioned um, something like this, this week as we mark International Women's Day, let's celebrate the boys and men in our lives who encourage us to be who we truly are, who treat girls and women with respect and who aren't afraid to speak up in front of others. We've got one day, <laughs> one day a year. All the rest, all the rest are for the boys. Oh, What's going that's on? That's right. Look, if I was married to that man, I'd probably want to celebrate it <laughs> yeah, too. hashtag humble brag. <laughs> However, yeah. however, how inappropriate was this for, yeah, the self-proclaimed, you know, feminist leader um, to come out with a statement like that was just so ridiculous. Mm. And by doing so, demeaned all the women around It completely disempowers them. I mean, this idea that here she says, let's let's celebrate the boys and men in our lives who encourage us to be who we truly are. Well, you should be encouraged to be who you truly are, (laughs) irrespective of whether or not boys and men encourage you to do that. And that's the whole point of feminism. I just... I'm still pretty gobsmacked by it. I, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely And astounded. I don't know whether I can forgive Justin, quite frankly. Do you think he knew about he, it? Well, he's he not completely have. complicit in yeah, it. I yes. mean, it was a photograph of him as well and I just, you know. I know, I know. It, do, it does sort of tarnish him just a little. But I must say, maybe we'll wait for next year. They might fix it up in time for International Women's Day 2018. <laughs> One can only hope. Well, we might move on to our final uh, topic, which is um, really trying to refocus attention, at least in Australia, where feminism is concerned, on Australian domestic politics. And and I wanted to raise that because there's been so much focus, as you know, um, on feminism more broadly, especially since the election of Trump and, of course, the disappointment um, Hillary Clinton's loss um, caused to so many feminists. Mm. There's the prospect of a new Supreme Court justice and um, abortion rights being under attack in the US that sometimes we forget Mm. about what the challenges are that women face here. Um, And one thing that I wanted to um, raise in that context was, in particular, the recent moves to try and decriminalise abortion in Queensland and New South Wales. And in Queensland, it's gone nowhere and as I understand it, in New South Wales, it's in a holding pattern. Mm. Rachel, what do you think? Do you think it's sort of too, it's easy for us to always look overseas and sometimes we uncomfortably um, or we fail to look at what's happening at home? Absolutely. Look, we look at the um, abortion debates in the US, which mm. are so polarised. Mm. Um, there are two issues that polarise politics in, in the States, abortion and guns, mm-hmm. um, and, and they're just so divisive. Yet, have a look at the criminal code here. Um, Mm. in Australia and have a look at what happens when you bring up the debate. So in Queensland, there was this situation where some politicians were flip-flopping and on edge and things like that and then, Mm. look, it just, you know, it just got nowhere. And then in New South Wales, um, I believe where we're up to is that um, the vote is is on its way for N12. Um, But again, raising the issue makes people either completely shut down mm. or a little bit borderline psychotic and a bit <laughs> a little yeah and and there is this underlying yeah. kind of look do we have to because aren't things okay, okay yeah. at yeah. the moment yeah. we're on the criminal code women don't yeah. actually have ownership yeah. over their body you mm. know during a medical procedure that's yeah mm, i think it's unbelievable. A, i agree with you Everybody. yeah yeah no it's um and it is it's not something that gets at all airtime at all, really. Um, I haven't seen much about it in the Australian context, and yet um, you hear a lot about it from America. And, uh, and, yeah, um, it does, I think, overshadow what's happening in Australia. Mm, It's interesting, actually, because... I don't know too much about it um, in either context, but certainly I even know the name of the American case. Mm, Rowan Wade. Wade. Mm. Everyone and I, knows I don't that. think I, I'm a lawyer, yeah. and I'm not sure if I could tell. I do yeah. actually know the name of the case in uh, Australia. That's because you looked it, it up. Other, well, I did look it up. <laughs> it was a Victorian case. Actually, I don't remember the, the name of the case, yeah. but I remember the name of the judge. Menhenet, I think. I probably got that wrong too, which says more <laughs> than anything. But it's interesting that there is that pervasive sort of um, focus on what's happening yeah. in the US and here yeah. in Australia we're facing similar sorts of issues. Mm. Um, I, I must say the current domestic um, political framework, and it's just something I was thinking as we were talking about this, is that there seems to be a failure to really address how domestic politics affects women in particular. Yeah. And one thing I was thinking about was the penalty cuts mm. decision. Mm. Um, and there's been a lot of work, I think, by Get Up and other NGOs which are focusing on how this detrimentally affects women because women are 
um, or more women are in the uh, mm. in that workforce that are affected. Mm. And it's sort of, I mean, it's interesting that you don't have, um, I guess, a feminist movement that is trying to counter these sorts of issues, either on decriminalisation of abortion or on, on penalty rates. I mean, what are the mm. things, Rachel, you think that ordinary women can do to um, act I guess, get active in these sorts of spaces and try and make a change. Support other women is the key. Is Look, if penalty rates don't affect you as a woman, recognise that they do affect another woman mm. who is financially disadvantaged, um, who is... Um, going to have less super in the long run, um, who is working a ridiculous amount of hours away from the um, children that they're caring for, um, for a rate that's going to be cut. Mm -hmm. So the first thing um, that we all need to do is, you know, um, as empowered women is look at those who, you know, have problems standing up and saying this is a feminist issue and I'm, I'm going to own it. So that's first and foremost um, what we can do. And... Ask men to own this as a feminist issue as well and say this will adversely affect women. This is, this is absolutely huge um, and, and absolutely put some onus of them to say feminism it will have benefits for you in the long run, whereas just degrading someone's position in society is going to hurt us all. Mm, no, I agree. And Erin, mm. what do you think? I mean, I know we've been on... Um, at least one march together, so we are quite uh, into our marches. But one, one thing that certainly after the um, Women's March um, that I thought was how can I make a difference in terms of uh, trying to, I don't know, make some little changes. I mean, everyone's busy and we all have hectic lives, but you want to do something positive. What, what are your thoughts on how we can do that? Yeah, I think it's really important to try and, and I think this can be hard for women, but you need to identify the power that you have and use your platform. Um, as a writer, I've got certain tools that I can use uh, in order to progress, um, uh, you know, the rights of women and, um, and to, to work towards a more equal society. Um, I think as citizens, we all have power. We have mm. power to, to lobby, to, to protest, to march, um, and we've got power to vote mm. as well. Um, and so I think you need to, to have a look at your life. As a lawyer, I've got other tools that I can use. Um, to, to, to help that. And I think you also need to recognise your own privilege. I think for women that can be hard because in a lot of ways women aren't privileged mm -hmm. and so they feel like they can, it's nothing, you know, there's, that, that, that they can do. Um, but, you know, the three of us, for example, have a lot of, um, you know, we've got a lot of power between us and the more of us we involve um the more opportunities we have to make change. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's interesting. I mean, I don't know if you followed the Cooper's Beer dramas yes, uh, you yeah. know, a week or two ago, mm. and, and that was an incredible um, expression of people power. I mean, that social media mm. campaign that was run um, against um, the Bible Society group and the use of the Cooper's Beer was incredibly effective. And mm. I must say, I was sitting there on Twitter that weekend watching mm. it all explode, and mm. I thought, wow. People can actually, you know, it's not a bit naive yeah. to sort of think that people actually yeah. can make a difference. But I think mm. that for women, it's, I think I agree with you. I think that sometimes it's a bit challenging for us to assert ourselves in that way because we're not used to being accepted um, as right. expressing our power. Yeah. But um, often it's something we're criticised for. Yeah, so exactly. stigmatised, yeah. yeah. So, so stigmatised to wear that. Absolutely. And Erin, you mentioned voting before, that mm. women don't in Australia don't seem mm. to own their identity as a woman when they vote. Mm. I've I've noticed that, that that voting as a feminist issue just kind of gets washed out. Mm. Yeah, whereas, you know, in, in the States, you know, you've got women for Obama and, you know, it's women for yeah. Hillary and, and things like that. But we just don't have that, um, you know, that identity politicking here. It's true. We're on, along gender lines when it comes to politics. Yeah. 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 It's I lament certainly that, not as pronounced. Actually. I, I, yeah. I lament yeah. that we don't own that more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, you see, you always see it a little bit after there's an election and you might get a couple of new females elected mm -hmm. and then there'll be a usual outcry about mm -hmm. the Liberals not having enough women in mm -hmm. Cabinet. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of where it ends. And you never then mm -hmm. see a kind of movement, mm -hmm. I don't know, like a women's party or something like that, which would then try to mm -hmm. itself um, affect change. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe we've got some... Um, <laughs> Viewers out there who've got some uh, great ideas on moving into the political system as women, we'd be 100% behind you, so um, go for it. Don't hold back. 
Anyway, well, thanks very much, guys, for um, joining me. And I say the word guys. I know that that's very controversial. <laughs> I mean it in a totally gender-neutral way um, for joining me on the third rail. It's been a really interesting conversation. Mm. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. I hope you enjoyed watching our feature episode on feminism. We'll see you next time on the third rail. Thank <laughs> you.